Hey everybody, this is Mike with the Mountain Weekly News. Welcome back, whoop whoop, episode 29 of the Everything Snowboarding and More podcast. I was uh, thinking about changing the name of this podcast because we're going to cover a lot more than snowboarding from here on out, but whatever, let's just roll with it. So anyway, episode number 29, Everything Snowboarding and More podcast. Uh, This podcast is free. You never have to pay to listen to this podcast, so I just want to throw that out there. Uh, Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Uh, We've got so much to catch up with. It is early September. It's already snowed in the high country. No, we're not skiing or snowboarding yet, but uh, it's just a great time to be in the mountains. The leaves are changing. Winter is almost here. We're starting to see videos, all sorts of snow stoke and more. So thanks for tuning in. Episode number 29 of the Everything Snowboarding and More podcast. A couple of months back, I was in uh, Denver, Colorado for the uh, Outdoor Retailer Trade Show. This was the first Outdoor Retailer Summer Market Trade Show to take place in Denver, Colorado. Uh, man, I had a blast. It, you know, That trade show used to be in Salt Lake City, and because of some political uproar, they actually moved the trade show to Denver, Colorado. So now the trade show is held in Denver twice a year. There's a winter market and a summer market. Uh, This year for the trade show, I wanted to do something different. We'd always done best of awards, editor's choice, you know, blah, 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 just kind of fluffing the good brands or the products that we really liked the best. This year, I wanted to give out awards for the best environmentally friendly products. You know, there's so many brands out there. um, Everybody wants to be green, but a few of these brands actually and the products really stood out. First up was Roughwear. Roughwear came up with a dog bed called the Rest Cycle Bed, which was made of the uh, recycled punch outs from when they make a backpack. So when they make a backpack, there's all these little leftover pieces of rubber, these tiny little pieces that are the size of, uh, you know, your fingernail, if not smaller. Uh, They're called punch outs. And these used to end up in the landfill. Now they're filling a dog bed. My dog loves it. Char's been testing it for a while. Uh, Kudos to Roughwear for coming up with a bed out of gear and out of material that would normally end up in the landfill. So that's the rest cycle bed, rest cycle bed from Roughwear. Second up is Astral. Astral has a line of hemp footwear. They've uh, the hemp Baker, the hemp Loak, and the hemp Maria shoes. These things are super soft. They're using hemp. Um, hemp is giving you an anti antimicrobacterial properties, all sorts of cool stuff. Anyway, hemp shoes, Astral, killer company. Um, not only are the shoes rad, but Astral makes that killer PFD, the uh, green jacket. That's the one that I wore all summer on the river the uh, rescue vest. So be sure to check out Astral. Toad and Company. Toad and Company has an eco standard. Toad and Company's eco standard means currently 90% of their products are eco-friendly, made of organic cotton, hemp, again, hemp, recycled polyester, wool, and things like that. So uh, Toad and Company is just this amazing company that makes outerwear. Um, it's oh, not outerwear, more of uh, lifestyle clothing. But uh, if you like Patagonia stuff, you're going to love Toad & Company. So again, Toad & Company, kudos for that eco standard. Next up with Costa Sunglasses. Costa Sunglasses teamed up with Boero, um, a company that basically takes recycled goods and turns them into rad stuff. So in this case, they got a pair of sunglasses made out of recycled fishing nets. How sick is that? Uh, I've had a chance to wear the sunglasses. Every time I wear them, it's a story. I'm like, you're not going to believe what these are made out of. Each year, it's estimated 64,000 tons of fishing nets are discarded, left in the ocean every year. So now there's something that you can actually do with them. Basically, they took the fishing nets, they melted them down into these little pellets. The pellets get created into a plastic, plastic mold type thing, and voila, now you have uh, recycled goods. Pretty killer. Next on the list was Soul. Soul is the company that makes shoes and footbeds. They made a line of recycled cork footbeds. How cool is that? They basically took wine corks and they made a full line of footbeds out of these. Not only footbeds, but they made sandals as well. These uh, footbeds and sandals are a little bit on the stiff side. So if you have a real mobile foot that likes to move side to side, these probably aren't for you, but they make footbeds that'll work for that. So kudos to Soul, another uh, rad company that's using goods that would normally end up in the trash. Last but not least was, well, actually, there's two more. Uh, Kelty, Kelty teamed up with um, Preserve Camp Kitchen. Preserve is a, a company that makes recycled goods, uh, makes plates and, and bowls and things of that nature out of recycled goods. So basically what they do is they take all your number five plastics, those yogurt cups, those uh, common household containers, they recycle them all together, and voila, now you have a line of plates and campware that you can take camping 
killer story. It's all recycled. Last but not least, I think it's last, uh, Sherpa Adventure Gear, the Lapka jacket. Sherpa Adventure Gear, what these guys do, they've got their uh, Okio standard certification, which means the Lapka jacket, along with all the materials used from the sewing to the inserts, pretty much everything has been certified as being non-harmful to the environment. Uh, since 2003, these guys have been helping to empower women in Nepal. Really killer story. If you're not familiar with Sherpa gear, be sure to check them out. We haven't reviewed any of their stuff in the past, but uh, that will be changing here soon. So that was some of the brands that stood out at the Outdoor Retailer Trade Show. So much buzz. It's great to have everybody under one roof now. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, the outdoor industry is really, really healthy. So rad first year for the summer trade show met with some great partners and uh, just had a great time along with checking out the uh, trade show when i was in denver i got to see the new boa factory boa has a staff of 121 current employees in denver with lots of room to grow they are taking over 80,000 square feet of this new 14,000 square foot or 104. They're taking over 80,000 square feet of this big ass building just outside of Denver. That's 140,000 square feet space. I was able to see uh, everything from production to R&D. I mean, when you go into the Boa factory, they've got departments just for like golf and snowboard and every single Every single thing you could think of BOA, they have a medical team. I mean, BOA makes stuff for medical. They make, in, I mean, just you name it. Uh, I was absolutely blown away um, by how big of a facility that was and just by the amount of people that they're able to hire in Denver. Most importantly, just the fact that they can do all the R&D work directly in-house, which is really, really killer. So kudos. Uh, I know I've said kudos like four times, but whatever. Uh, right on, BOA, that's sick. These guys, Denver, Colorado. Um, I used to not be a fan of BOA. I got turned on to it recently, and I think that for a lot of applications, BOA is definitely here to stay. Last month, I had a chance to go to Madison, Wisconsin, thanks to Red Bull. Red Bull sent me out to cover the Red Bull Archers Paradox. The Red Bull Archers Paradox is probably one of the coolest competitions I've ever uh, had a chance to be a part of, watch, witness, and uh, something that... I definitely would love to enter myself and I will <laughs> I hope to be back next year to cover it. Basically the Red Bull Archers Paradox what this is is a archery competition meets trail running race. <laughs> Need we say more? Uh, I'm going to let some of the uh, competitors tell their story, tell what archery is, and uh, yeah, here's some uh, interviews from Madison, uh, Wisconsin. David Benner. David, uh, have you done a contest like this before? No, this is the first time. This was a uh, very, very cool, yeah. unique, once in a lifetime, really. I've never heard of anything as cool as this. For sure. I saw you come across the finish line. That was really awesome. Uh, what did you think about the course? It was really tough going uphill for sure. Yep. And then once you were going downhill, some big guy like me had trouble slopping his momentum. Yep. So it was like I was uh, either going to snowball all the way down or I had to, you know, like stomp my feet every single time just to slow my momentum. But it was, it was a rush. It was an absolute rush the whole time going all the way there. Uh, the target's trying to slow your heart rate up just enough to, to make a good shot so then you could you not have to run very many or if any penalty laps. It was, it was awesome. How did you do on the targets? I only missed one. I missed the apple. Really? You only had to do one penalty lap? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my brother had to do three or two or three. So. Yeah, I saw a lady have to do four. Yeah. Oh, oh man. man. That would be the worst. Yeah. Especially that penalty lap is uphill. Uh -huh. It's a killer. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 Uh, what kind of background do you have in archery? Uh, you know, I'm actually uh, the archery club uh, advisor at Northern Illinois University. I'm going to try to use this to try to do something similar and host it for uh, the group. Can I interview you guys? You can. <laughs> uh, my name is Mike. I'm with the Mountain Weekly News. We're in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, we actually just came out here with Red Bull to write a story about this event. So um, have you guys ever done something like this before? Nothing no. like it no. at all. No. no. Okay. Uh, let's see. What are your guys' names and where are you from? Uh, Derek Wright from Madison, Wisconsin. Kyle Grange, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Bradley Salamo from Bloomington, Illinois. Joe Guglielmo, Madison, Wisconsin. Paulina Bright from Bloomington, Illinois. And um, let's see, what's your experience with shooting bows? You guys bow hunters? Yep, deer hunting, shooting yeah, bows. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how about running? Are you guys runners as well? Uh, yeah. Not as much as I should be. <laughs> Cardio is hardio. Yeah. As, of, as of this year, I started running. I not so much running. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the red shirt, what was your name again? Bradley. 
Bradley, had you already run today? Yeah. Okay, I got some photos of you on course, ripping, running really, really hard. So that was actually cool. I, I, that's why I was like, are you not a runner? Yeah, that's good. He's trying to work off the Wendy's. And what are the prizes today you guys can win? For, uh, it's a Triax bow. Triax bow and cash money. Cash. Thousand bucks cash. Yeah. Thousand bucks cash. First gets a thousand, the second gets seven hundred, the third gets five. Where's our, where's our friend from up north? He's already claimed that. That's his. Yeah. yeah. This week's special guest on the Mountain Weekly News, Everything Snowboarding and More, episode number 29, is Makua Rothman. Makua Rothman is a Hawaiian surfer, big wave charger. We're going to talk about surfing, snowboarding, music, and a little bit more. What's up, buddy? How are you? I got an email that said that you were making music these days, and uh, obviously we know about you as a surfer, but uh, what's up with the uh, Keep Aloha Aloha? Yeah, it's just my new music project that's uh, being recorded right now. Uh... I've been back and forth in the recording studio these last couple of months, and trust it's been so amazing. It's the first time I actually feel like my music. I mean, my last project was awesome, but I really think this one's gonna take off, man. This one's gonna be like the one that sets it apart from the rest of my stuff I ever did. When uh, a lot of times when I interview people in the music industry, uh, one question they always hate is, you know, like what what influences do you have growing up? Because it's such a a generic thing. But you know, you uh, being from Hawaii, like what? What kind of music? I mean, was it the ukulele? Like, what were the first, you know, sounds or concerts that you remember seeing or hearing? Well, I mean, I got a song about one of my first things in life. It goes, I was only three years old when the cops banged the door down, told my mama, no, no. Just real life shit. You know, I grew up a little different than a lot of people. And, you know, I had a tent on the beach. Never had a house. Um, you know, a lot of shitty things, but. With that shitty thing comes inspiration, comes the will and the desire to succeed in life and become something you want it to be, you know, you always dreamed about, you know, because fuck, you're already at the bottom, there's no other way to go but up, so might as well try and get yourself all the way up, you know? For sure, and I think that a lot of people, you know, once you're at the bottom, that's, that's the, the easiest way to see that top, you know, a lot of people that maybe haven't experienced that just don't have that same drive or that, you know, motivation. A lot of people get to the bottom with drugs and stuff. It's not a, not too, uh, you know, a lot of the greatest people, you know, you start off down there. Just um, not really something you chose. It's just what was up and just the life I was dealt. And it was a beautiful life. I lived on the beach, but I lived at Sunset Beach in Hawaii. And I wasn't homeless. I was just houseless back then. <laughs> so why you always be home? And um, just the desire to my dad proud and make my make my people of Hawaii proud is what inspired me, you know. People like Duke Kahanamoku and Eddie Aikau and you know, some of the greatest Hawaiians who ever graced this planet, you know, the Duke took our sport of surfing and shared it with the whole entire world, you know. The music in Hawaii goes hand in hand with surfing. You jam, you surf, the boys come in, jam music, barbecue. It's just kind of a way of life, you know. It wasn't like oh, it's in my career. This is what I do, and <laughs> that's just kind of how I was. You talked about, you know, all those uh, legendary watermen from, you know, Hawaii. kind of sets, um, you know, big wave surfers apart from your general person? Sure. Just take a look at those waves, man. It's kind of like we're Navy SEALs of what we do, and I was blessed to have someone like Laird Hamilton and Derek Dorner to basically make me the guinea pig. It's like, hey, try this, boy, and see what happens. All right. They will try that different, and, you know, and surfing was created right outside my house, out here at Backyards, and Kirby Fletcher and them did it before, but it wasn't something that anybody, you know, took to the next level, and, you know, there, and that whole strap crew, it was all right out here in front of my house, and we moved over to Jaws, and I was just kind of in the right place at the right time, so. When you first started surfing Jaws, uh, how old were you when you first paddled? First time I went to Piahi was, I think I was 14, um, and the summer three. Yeah, there was no kids, I mean, surfing it back then at all. I was the youngest kid to ever surf jobs back then. I mean, there's some kids that tow it now that are, you know, young, but back then, it, it was, like I said, this wasn't like a, a thing that kids did, you know? <laughs> Some grown men, and these guys just kind of took me under the wing and said, well, come with us we got something cool that we're creating we want you to be a part of it so that first time at Jaws was a crazy experience seeing what they were doing before I got there and then 
actually my dad letting me go over there, I couldn't believe he did that. <laughs> there was no blow up vest, there was no you know, there was one the first few generations of of uh life vests and that was it, you know. Well and that that's a good point uh point you brought up about the life vest. Um do you feel that have you seen guys in the water that maybe um their skill level isn't there to be surfing big waves, but they feel that um, they have this vest and now maybe they can uh, pull yeah. this instead of being a strong swimmer? 80% of the guys out there should not be out there. Their skill level is pretty much zero. I mean, I guess anybody can hold on, let go, and fucking wipe out. You know what I mean? A lot of the times what you see nowadays, and it's like, for me, it was something I did since I was young. Out here in the shore breaks in Hawaii, you're moving up to bigger and bigger waves, and you know, surfing is my life. You know what I mean? It's a lifestyle. These guys all of a sudden, oh, we can tow in and get this one wave and get on the Billabong XXL, and all of a sudden we're a big wave surfer. That's why I don't think that whole XXL thing is done right because any Tom Dick in the world can enter, and all of a sudden he's a big wave surfer. Right? I really think for big wave surfing, you have to put in your time and show that you actually live and breathe this stuff before you can become big wave surfer, you know? So the vest, you're you're kind of, like you said, 80% of the guys maybe shouldn't be out there. Well, you know what's cool is nowadays, you know, especially with the paddling is, a lot of the guys, they just get weeded out, period. You know what I mean? The paddling to one is a whole different story than to pull into one. In the spot on a really big wave and catch it, you gotta have some skill. And a lot of these guys are out there. Like I said, 80% of the guys are in the way, whether it's a toe session or a, or a paddle session. It's just like, I don't know, really know how to huh. police it and just kind of self police that stuff and do our own kind of, you know, water control while we're out there. But it's almost like those guys are the ones putting everybody at danger. We gotta go save those guys or. Like you said, same thing about about snowboarding, man. They come, they get their fancy apparatus, and they freak all of a sudden and do it. You know, it's, they're the guys now. I had interviewed um, Laird a few uh, about a year ago, and uh, one of the questions I asked him is if he still paddled into waves, and he he kind of laughed at me, and I said, "Well, no, you know, I see you doing the foil and the toe surfing. Like, are you still paddling in? Because you know, I grew up surfing myself, and uh, I've never done the toe surfing, but I know paddling. I mean, you the guy that." the strongest paddler is going to be able to sit out the back and, and catch that wave a little easier. And kind of how it happens. I mean, not, I can't speak for Larry, but, you know, he's my – I lived with him, and I still stay with him every time I'm in Cali, and I train under him. And he just kind of sees it as, you know, the sport has progressed. Smaller board on a bigger wave, more ripping, more, more performance as we're paddling in. You paddle in, you take off, you put, you know, the huge board, you go straight – yeah, maybe you can get barreled, but the whole time you're doing nothing. You're just standing there fucking barely making it when you should be on a 6 old fucking ripping the lip off, getting barreled in a huge air or fucking doing a huge car. Like, it's like, I, I, I like the paddling. I paddle in too, but it's almost like guys are too into, oh, we don't tow anymore. We can't paddle in. We're well, fucking perfect. Look at Fiji. The way I call it, you ain't paddling that way. You know what I mean? Look at Tahiti when it's bombing. You ain't paddling that way. Garing 100%, you're not catching that fucker on the surfboard that way. So now what? Like, there's time and a place. Like, you know, some of those mountains, you're not going to do things that you can't do. You're not going to hike up to fucking somewhere and, and get that ultimate ride. You just can't get there, you know? What's your so thoughts like, on, um, you know, wiping out versus making a wave? I mean, obviously, the, you know, the wave you caught at Chokes was freaking insane. Uh, do you get bummed if you don't make the wave? You know, when you push the limit and you try and get yourself, you know, surf the wave a different level and try and get as deep as possible you can, sometimes you don't make it. And to push the limit, sometimes you got to fail, you know, to where to see where you can and can't be. And, you know, there's there's great honor in a failed attempt. There's no honor in no attempt at all, you know. He fell or he did this or he did that. But, hey, fuck, at least he was on that wave. He was riding it. And you're over there talking shit in the channel. You know what I mean? Right. Sitting on the boat in the like, channel or something. <laughs> you know, guys try. Just because they didn't make it doesn't mean 
You know, we don't have a set course. We don't have a set court. It's not the same wave every time. We don't get to practice on the same exact thing. We don't get to shoot 40 fucking free throws in a row. Like, And to push the limits with Mother Nature, sometimes you're not going to make it. Also makes for a great story as well. You know, the wipeout, the stuff that you got to endure for not making it. Some, some of those waves you don't make, oh, those are the craziest waves anybody's ever... I mean, the wave I caught in Fiji... Biggest wave anybody's ever caught out there. So obviously the biggest wipeout anybody's ever had. And to just survive <laughs> that wipeout was fucking nuts. You know what I mean? For sure. How do you, uh, do you do any um, breath work or do you do like free diving training with any of the guys? I've been free diving my whole life. Valley, Marquee guys and, you know, all that shit. That's what we grew up doing. Surfing, ocean was our life. Whether it was fishing, hunting, diving, you know, in the ocean, whatever it was. And, now it's a pool training that nerd guys do and all these other techniques we got, the Wim Hof breathing, it all goes hand in hand, man. Anything to give yourself a few extra seconds on the water, right? And just like Avalanche, we don't got no referee to say time out or there's no captain in our sport. Cap, ready to come back to the surface, all right. Put you back uh, in the cap is on your chest if you don't make it, you know? <laughs> What's your thoughts on uh, the stand-up paddleboard? Well, stand-up paddleboarding is awesome. It's the... Uh, it's another form of expressing yourself in the ocean, man. You be a waterman, you do everything. So people might say, oh, I'm a poop board, gogi board, surfboard. Fuck all that, bro. Waterman is waterman. You fish, you hunt. Yep. You freaking die, free dive. You stand up paddle. You foil. You're in the water, you're a waterman, bro. Big up to anybody that, that puts the time in to be great at something in the ocean. No matter what it's. And we kind of feel the same way, you know, skiing versus snowboarding. There used to be this. It's real, you know, oh, you're a skier, you're a snowboarder, because I'm a mountain, surfer. Man. Dog, if you see all those guys, mountain, with your BMX or your mountain bike when the snow is melted, you know, mountain, man. Uh, what about the Olympics? Do you think uh, surfing, is that an Olympic activity, or what's your thoughts on that? I mean, the Olympics, I think, like any other sport, has to be a set course. I mean... Surfing, the essence of surfing is catching, missing, and maybe not getting the perfect ride all the time. So what they're going to do is they're just going to commercialize it and make it the same wave every time. Everybody gets a chance and take away the mystique of maybe not catching a wave in your heat. You know, maybe having to catch a junk one and turn it into a good one to make the score, you know. Surfing is all about diversity and, and different waves and and creating opportunity when there is no opportunity. Digging deep and getting that score and, and finding that wave, you know? Yes. Surfing was never a, a perfect wave sport every single wave, every time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's something in the water, and, and it's going to bring a lot of attention to the sport of surfing, which is great. And, and any publicity that surfing can get to the mainstream is wonderful for our sport. You know, I'm an ambassador of surfing, period. Whether it's in a pool, out the pool, whatever it is, I want to see our sport grow exponentially and become a mainstream sport. And if it, that means having the pools where people serve, so be it. How long until we see the Rick Canes? I mean, somebody that's literally grown up in, you know, Levermore or wherever these new wave pools are and doesn't really have access to the ocean, but goes and their you know, mom and dad drops them off every day and all of a sudden this kid is just I mean, like until rich. the wave gets good, once they get the pipeline and shit, they're going to shit their pants. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it's not going to be in the same spot. They're not going to be riding any fucking board. It's going to be a lot of different variables, like I said. You know what I mean? Even the buoyancy, you know, paddling versus, you know, salt water versus that fresh water, I heard that it's just a lot Whatever. different to get the wave in that. You get your fucking head planted into the fucking bottom or you hit the bottom real hard or that way fucking knocks your socks off it's gonna be like holy cow maybe i don't like this <laughs> <laughs> for sure uh i guess last but not least um for any of our listeners that aren't surfers or they haven't spent much time in hawaii uh what does aloha mean to you aloha aloha is the essence of our life it's our breath the aloha the ha is it's when we greet each other and we put our heads to head and head to head and we we'll go, you know, we put our forehead together and we breathe in each other's palm, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a breath. It's the breath of, of Hawaii. Aloha. 
Aloha, you know, it means hello, it means good mind, it means all this stuff, but in the real meaning of aloha, it's that breath. And that's why they say hot woman, you know, what they call that guy's a haole or whatever. There's no such thing as haole, it's not a white skinned person. Hot ole means the one without. You know, ha, like I said, the breath, ole, without, it doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have that, that breath that we have. So that's how they differentiate, yeah, it's not, hey, like anything, our words have been commercialized, bro, <laughs> and, and turned into different things, but, uh, I'm, uh, really honored to be able to share some mana'o, our wisdom with you guys, and any, if there's any chance I could get over to you guys in Jackson Hole, man, that would be a dream come true. I love snowboarding, so does my family. And man, one day I gotta come and visit and come check out your guys' office or something. Maybe do a, let's do a little shoot or something where the surfer boy comes to Jackson Hole and I can just do huge cars, just ah, wide open in the forest, away from everything, and just be so free. Up. And that's why I love the mountains. You know, I hunt a lot. I, I spend a lot of time in the hills, man. I'm not just an ocean guy. I'm a mountain man. Just as much as I am an ocean man. I love the mountains so much, man. It's like my refuge, the mountains. You get out and, and be away from all the city and the hustle and bustle. And you get out there and clear your mind. And feel that energy and rub your feet in the dirt. And... Well, I want to keep in touch with you, brother, because um, winter's right around the corner. And I'm serious about coming over there. Talking to you that deep snow is no joke, bro. That thing will make you so strong up at elevation. Oh. All right, brother. I'll all right, brother. You soon, all right? Take care. All right. Aloha. Okay. Aloha. All right. Well, that was a killer interview with Makua. Uh, we really appreciate having him on the show. Be sure to check in next week. We'll have more fun guests, all sorts of good stuff. And uh, at this point, we are turning the show back on. So thanks again for tuning in. Episode number 29 of the Everything Snowboarding and More podcast. Peace. Peace.